Hello, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the second part of this this couple series. This little series about why the rapture. I believe the rapture will happen on Rosh Hashanah in 2024. I've walked through this before. Well, now I figured out how to get the Bible up over here, and I had some questions, and I thought I would walk through it again, and so I can show you everything from Scripture that I'm looking at. Um, in the first video, and if you haven't seen the first video, please go back and watch it, or this isn't going to make sense. We talked about the mysteries, the sodes, the secret from Amos 3.7 and what they are and how they're things hidden in Scripture, not meant to come out until um, later in time, and that God's telling us about how Messiah is going to come back through that. He does nothing without telling us through these sodes, through these secrets, what he's going to do. Okay? And there are many of them, and I've done videos on them, and I will continue to do videos on different sodes or mysteries that tell us Messiah comes back 2,000 years from when he left. But we need to know how to count those 2,000 years. In the last video, we also looked at why we know that Messiah was crucified on Passover, but also that he was, um, that he will come back on Rosh Hashanah. Understanding the feast days, the appointed time of the Lord, is so important, especially when you come to doing the math. Otherwise, your math will be off. We spoke about because of these sodes, and all this is in that first video, but that Messiah will come back 2,000 years from when he left. If you can find the date that Messiah was crucified, which I believe is 32 AD, and I'm going to explain that in the next video, how I get there. You just add 2,000 minus 7, but do it on God's calendar, not this pagan Roman calendar that we're using. And that's what we're going to focus on today. Okay, so let's open up our Bibles. Get out your Bibles. Now I'm going to have a, let me go ahead and open up mine. All I got to do is click on that. And we're going to open up in the book of um, Mark, Mark 1. Okay, you ready? And again, open yours up. You might want to make notes, whatever. It's easier that way. And it came to pass in those days. Oh, those days. Sounds like very specific days. Well, they are. And we'll see that in a minute. When Jesus came from, the Na from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Okay, we all know about the baptism of Messiah where the Holy Spirit came in and landed on his shoulders. He was anointed. And immediately, coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. And then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in who I am well pleased. So Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all together right here, the triunity. Immediately, how long did it take? Oh well, no, immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan and was with the wild beast, and the angels ministered to him. All right. Okay, we know what time this is because of the 40 days. 40 days in Hebrew would be teshuva. It's a time of prayer and repentance, and teshuva just means repentance. Um, and it starts at a low one and ends on Tishri 10. What's Tishri 10? Yon Kippur. What is the fulfillment of Yon Kippur? Armageddon, when Messiah defeats Satan. What did he do at the end of the 40 days? He defeated Satan. It's a foreshadowing. The 40 days in the wilderness is kind of a foreshadowing of what Messiah will do on Yom Kippur. And this is also a time of prayer and repentance. Because, because Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur are the days of awe. They are the most important days on the Jewish calendar. Okay, And, and it's believed that Rosh Hashanah, the door... A door is open on Rosh Hashanah, and everybody's judged when everybody's truly good or truly bad. Okay? And then if you're not judged, you know, good on Rosh Hashanah, and it has to, whose names will be written on the in the Book of Life. So if your name is not written in the Book of Life on Rosh Hashanah, you have 10 more days to get right with God. And the books are closed. The door is closed on Yom Kippur. Okay, so this 40 days is about getting ready for that time period. This is always the time that they would have believed that Messiah would be coming during that time. And at this point, based on Daniel 9, it was especially 
high watch period. Yes, they had watch periods, high watch periods. You heard that term all the time. But we have them like every other day. No, they had one period of the year when they were expecting Messiah to come, and that was during the fall feast days. Same as today, really. Anyhow, um, so, give me a second. So what had Messiah done to this point? Um, he turned some water into wine, went out in the desert, or went baptized, went out in the desert, hung out with Messiah, hung out with Satan at the end of that 40 days, and then came back and started his ministry. Correct? Understood? Yeah. We know when it is. But let's look to Luke, and we want to see something Luke can add to the story. Go down to Luke 3.23. Luke 3.23. Now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Halil. So he's about 30. He wasn't 30 yet. If you look at that word about, we're going to go into tools. Why do you have to look up the word about? About means about. Let's look it up. About, as, like, as it had been, as it were, like as. Okay, so it's like it was 30, as though he was 30 years, as he was 30, like he was 30. Okay, so he's not quite 30, and you have to be 30 years old to start your ministry. Do you ever think, ask yourself the question, why did Messiah need to be baptized? Was he full of sin and he was baptizing to get the sin out? Because that's what people were doing at that point. No. Messiah was about to make a change. He was about to become a rabbi. He, and, and one would be baptized in order to start that phase of his life. That's why he told John, you know, you have to do this. I need you to do this. This is important. You know, I always wondered, why did Messiah have to be baptized? What sin did he have in him? All right. Um, so we know that Messiah was, he was actually told us that he was born sometime after that time. But we know that he started his ministry at the beginning of the year near Rosh Hashanah in Yom Kippur. You follow that? All right. It's important. Now, a lot of people believe, and Rosh Hashanah is the New Year's. Now, a lot of people believe, no, 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 God changed that. Um, that doesn't change things. But a lot of people believe God changed that and know that the New Year now starts in the spring. So let's look into this. Let's dig into this. we got to get this straight. we got to understand. Well, there's actually two calendars. And if you saw the video I recently did about um, the Alpha and the Tav and the first month. There's two first months, two calendars. But let's go through this again. And so I can show you this. Go to Exodus 12. Exodus 12. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of the month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for the household. So we know this is Passover, and it's not the beginning of the year. It is the beginning of months and the first month of the year to you. See, the new year is on Rosh Hashanah, but it's the seventh month. You set the months by this year. What do, you, what do you mean set the months? That God has a way of keeping his calendar so that his months always fall in the right time of the year. Um, today they do it with a leap month. Try to find a leap month in, in the scripture. You won't. Constantine helped with that. Not good. Anyhow, so this year, after Adar, there will be Adar 2 and then Nisan. Adar 2 is not in scripture. So it's possible all of the calendar will be off by a month before we even start Nisan. The first month won't be set right. So how do you know how to set it right? Um, we go to 
where you want to go. Deuteronomy 16. And we'll see this. Deuteronomy 16, verse 1. Observe the month of Abib and keep the Passover to the Lord your God. For in the month of Abib, the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. So we know that Abib is Nisan. I don't think you'll find another name for another month in Scripture. This is the only month that has a name, Abib. You could be wrong, but I haven't seen it. So what does Abib mean? We're going to find it's more of a description than it is. You see Abib here? It's more of a description than it is a name. Fresh, young barley ears, barley, the month of ear forming, the greening of the crop, the green, growing green of Bib, the month of Exodus and the month of Passover. So this month doesn't start until the barley is almost, and they call it a Vib, a V as in Victor, I-V, even though this month is a Bib, but we talk about it being the barley being a Vib, A-V-I-V. -V. The barley has to be almost ripe to start the month. If it's not, if the barley doesn't meet this condition, you don't start the month. Okay, why is this important? Well, this would start Nisan, and we know that on Nisan 10, you take the, the Passover lamb into the house. He's crucified on the 14th, okay? The 15th starts the Feast of Unleavened Bread, where Messiah was in the grave, and the the day after the next Sabbath is the Feast of First Fruits, where Messiah arose because he is the first fruits of the resurrection of life. And what they would do is take a stalk of barley, a bundle, a sheet of a sheet of barley, and wave it. Uh, Messiah is the first fruits of the resurrection of life. If it was just one little one, it wouldn't work because when Messiah arose. Lots of others arose with him. And we'll see that. Let's go ahead and look. I've got this look up in my Bible. I'll find this passage. It's Matthew 27 ish, 26, 27, somewhere in that ballpark. But I'll find it here quickly, hopefully. Hmm. And I'm not. Give me a second. It is Matthew 27. Go ahead and go there real quick. Matthew 27. And you're looking at 50 through 53. Here we go. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. He passed. And, the, and behold, the veil was torn in two from top to bottom. No wasted words in scripture. Top to bottom. A Jewish man, if he'd lost his firstborn son, would take his robe and tear it from top to bottom. God lost his firstborn son. And he was quaked and the rocks were split. And the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after the resurrection, they went into the holy city, and they appeared to many. All right, so what is this? I used to wonder, you know, a bunch of goats came out, were haunting everybody. No, these were people resurrected, people that went back into the city. What a testimony that this is God. This was the Son of God that was crucified. Um, see, a sheet of barley, not a stalk. So there had to be a bundle. This is the first fruits of the resurrection of life. The harvest, the first fruits. The rapture will be the main harvest. And after the, after the uh, tribulation period, where those that lost their head come back to life, those will be the gleanings. Those are the parts of a harvest. And I am way off track of where I was going. If you enjoyed it, let's get back to the two calendars. So that's how you tell the calendars, by the barley. Um, let's go down to Leviticus 23. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. 
Well, I want to start in Leviticus 23.22, just to point one thing out I always thought was interesting. Between the spring and the fall feast days, there's one, and all of these are prophetic. Okay, just as the, the fulfillment of the spring feast days were fulfillment, the fulfillment of the fall feast days were, are going to be prophetic. But verse 22, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of the field. When you reap, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. In other words, you better do it because I am the Lord your God. And I'm telling you to do it. You have one verse about sowing and reaping the church age in between the spring and the fall feast days. But when you see the rapture, which would be the Feast of Trumpets, it's on the seventh day of the seventh month, on the first day of the month. Um, seventh month, even though it's the beginning of the new year. In Leviticus 25, you'll see that, and we're not going to go there, but a year of Jubilee starts at the tenth day of the month, on the seventh month. If, understand that if this is no longer the new year, then it had to have changed the year of Jubilee as well, but they didn't. Um, Go to Leviticus, Ezekiel 40. Oh, Ezekiel 40. And Ezekiel 40 to 48 are all about the millennial kingdom. In the 25th year of our captivity, at the beginning of the year, on the 10th day of the month, this is where he got his vision for the millennial kingdom. And that's why I talked about how I believe that a you know, I miss doing all that. I'm supposed to do that in the last teaching. Hmm. Maybe I'll do. I'll try to pick that up here. Um. Yeah, I did miss it. I'm sorry. I gotta get back my head back in here. All right. The twenty on the C forty one twenty fifth year of our captivity, the beginning of the year on the tenth day of the month. This is the New Year's at the seventh month. The year of Jubilee starts at the seventh month. This just indicates it's a year of Jubilee. And let's just jump into it from here. Where else we see a year of Jubilee? And we talked about it the last teaching, how I believe that's when the Millennial Kingdom is a year of Jubilee, when they go into the Millennial Kingdom. And it's also when the children of Israel went into the Promised Land was a, was a year of Jubilee. And I don't think we can count from way back then to now because there are years missing from the calendars. We don't know where or how people will make up numbers, but nobody's going to tell you from Scripture how many years are missing. Otherwise, we're in, what, 57, 57-something, 57 58-something? What year are we in right now? Um, 5790 or whatever year it was. We'd be waiting until year 6,000 for the rapture otherwise. There are years missing. So with that said, go to Ezekiel, I'm sorry, Isaiah 61. You got to understand the calendar. And I'm probably giving you more information than you need, but that's not a bad thing. This is what, you know, Messiah had quoted. And we're going to go and look at that in a minute. Do you see where it says to proclaim the acceptable the year of the Lord? That's a year of Jubilee. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Verse, verse 1, Isaiah 61, 1. And think about what has Messiah done at this point? When he's, he's reading this, by the way, he's reading this as soon as he comes out from the desert. From the 40 days of Teshuvah. This is what he's reading. Spirit, and that would be on the Yom Kippur. Think about that. Anyhow, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. To preach good tidings to the poor, has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty for the captives, and opening the prison to those who are bound. And proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And what did he not read? And the day of vengeance of our God. Well, that's the second coming. The day of vengeance is the second coming. Had he done this when he read it? Um, and I would say no. So now we want to go to, uh, give me one second. I think it's Luke. I could be wrong. I'm going to take a minute. We want to go to Luke 4. 
Luke four down to like nineteen. Okay, and Messiah has just left some of the 40 days in the wilderness. He's come and the Spirit brought him to back to Nazareth. Um, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, on the Sabbath, and the year, uh, the day of year, uh, the day of Yom Kippur is always a Sabbath. And he handed the book to the prophet, the prophet Isaiah, and he opened up the book and he found the place where it was written exactly what we just read. Proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He closed the book and gave it back to the attendants, and all the eyes were of the synagogue were fixed on him. In other words, you, you stopped in the middle of a verse. You didn't even read that much. What's up? And they're looking at him. He sat down. That means teaching moment. Back then, the teachers didn't stand way up above everybody on a podium. No, no, they sat down to teach. Today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. But it wasn't. He hadn't done those things. I believe this is what's called a prophetic tense of a verb. In other words, something is going to be so, it's in Hebrew, uh, the verbs have different tenses. You're in a verb, and you can't see it in English, but it could be, it could tell you that it's temporary, it's permanent in the, by the verb, and the way the verbs are written in Hebrew. Matthew was written in Hebrew. But anyhow, I did a video about languages too. If you don't, if that's a problem with, for you, Go back and check out that video. Um, anyhow, it is could be that it's some a prophetic tense of a verb is where something is so assured of happening, you say it as if it already did. So we're looking at two calendars. All right. Um, and we did the video that talked about the two first months and how Messiah fulfilled the spring feast days. He will come back and fill the fall feast days. I have to do this because so many people don't believe that Rosh Hashanah is the head of the year, is the beginning of the year, is they, they think it's been moved, but God doesn't change things. Now, in order to count, there's things we have to understand about Daniel 9. So I want to take some time in Daniel 9, and this might make the video a little longer, but it's okay. I think you'll appreciate this, because everybody knows Daniel 9, 27. But do you really understand Daniel 9? Let's go there. And I'm not going to pick through all of this. If you, I have longer teachings about Daniel 9. If you go to YouTube, put Dave Call Daniel 9, you'll find them. We're just going to pick out a few verses here. Verse 2. Verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. In other words, Jerusalem is going to be desolate for 70 years, and they're going to be in Babylon for 70 years. I don't know where this is in Jeremiah, but we can find it in, um, give me a second, We're, we want to go to Second Second Chronicles 36, down near the end. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be filled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, that it might be made a proclamation throughout the kingdom. Oh, wait a I, I went, didn't go back far enough. I apologize. Let's go to verse 20. And those who escaped from the sword he carried away to Babylon, where they become servants to him and his sons, until the rule of the kingdom of Persia. Fulfill the word by the Lord, by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath. As long as she lay desolate, she kept her Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. So what it is, is the biggest thing, and the Sabbath is huge for God. That's like the biggest thing. It's like the wedding ring that shows that you belong to him if you keep the Sabbath. And what the Sabbath is every seven years, there's a Sabbath for the land. And they miss 70 of them, and they happen every seven years. Seven times 70, you get it? 70 years, seven-year cycles. Um, so they're in there for 70 years. Now let's walk back through Daniel again. 70 times 7, these are weeks of years, with a Sabbath year at the end of them. Daniel 9, we're just going to look at a couple places here. 
haven't really gone to this much depth in a while in Daniel. Let's go to verse 11. Yes, all of Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so not to obey your voice. So they're not obeying the voice of the Lord. They're not obeying the law. And therefore, the curse of the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God has been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. What does he mean? The curse of the oath written by the law in the law of Moses. Understand the law is not cursed. Okay. Understand what he's saying here. You got to go to Deuteronomy 28. This is important. I, I believe it is. See, you know, this is blessings on obedience and curses on obedience. Now it shall come to pass if you did diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God and observe carefully all of his commandments, which I command you today. Doesn't that sound familiar? Go to Matthew 28 real quick. Oh, sorry about that. Oops, wrong one. Go to Matthew 28. Go down to the end. The Great Commission. What are we supposed to teach people? Our disciples. But what are you supposed to teach them? Teaching them to observe all the things I have commanded you. <laughs> observe all the things I commanded you. Who wrote for us? Messiah, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All right, I'm off a little bit, but that's okay. Um, let's go back to, um, where are we at? Deuteronomy? My apologies, give me a sec. Deuteronomy, yeah, Deuteronomy 28. Oh, it's beyond sound alignment. And that should come to pass if you diligently obey the Lord your God to observe Carefully, all of his commandments. Who wrote the commandments? Messiah did. All right. If we look here, it starts off with, and these are all the blessings. You go down and all the blessings. Now, if you start in verse 15, there are all the curses. Okay. Uh, but now, I'm going to look this up in my Bible. I didn't write down the exact verse. Actually, I told them that they're going to be taken off to Babylon. It didn't mention Babylon. But Daniel got it. Deuteronomy 28, we want verse 36. The Lord will bring you, and this is if you're not following the law, the Lord will bring you and the king whom you set over you to a nation which neither you nor your fathers have known, and there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone. This is the point where they have a last king. This is this is that point. Um, let's walk down in Daniel. We're not going to be that much longer here, but then again, you can tell by the time. I don't see it because I haven't finished it yet. Let's go back to Daniel. I'll try to take less little tracks out of here in different places, little rabbit trails. What do we want to go to Daniel 9, verse 20. Daniel's praying. What is he praying for? Um, 18, I'm sorry. God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes. And see our desolations, the city which you called by your name. For we did not present our supplications before you, because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. Okay, so we're not, he's not praying because of their righteousness, it's because of his mercy. What is it? Why is he saying incline your ear and hear? We got to go there. Sorry. We're going to go to uh, Proverbs 28. And we want to look at verse 9. Why would Daniel say that? One who turns his ear away from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. So Daniel saying, hey, please hear us, because God's not going to hear an abomination. We know that our prayers are, mercy, are, you know, are sweet incense that God's going to burn. We see that in the book of Revelation. If it's an abomination, he ain't burning it. He hears one who turns his ear away from the law, he ain't going to hear that. Let's go back to Daniel. 
Back to Daniel 9. I am going somewhere with this. Okay, where do we want to go next? 20. What is he praying for? He's confessing for my sin, the sin of the people of Israel, and for the Lord, for the holy mountain of God, for Jerusalem. Daniel's royalty, he can do that. So now let's go down to verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined for your people. So this is 70 weeks or 70 sets of seven years. Does that sound familiar? It should. Um, go to Matthew 18. And we want verse 22. Starting in 21, and Peter came and saying, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him up to seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to 70 times, but 70 times seven. He's talking about the forgiveness of Israel. That's what Daniel 9.27 is all about. Let's go back to Daniel. So 24, I'm not going to walk through all these things that it's for. Um, to finish transgressions, to make an end of sin, all these things. It's basically to set everything right by the time this thing's. Okay, no one understand. In the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The streets shall be built again, the walls, even in troublesome times. Interesting. Um, know that the understanding that going forth to command, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, 69 weeks. You get it? After 62 weeks, so you already had the seven weeks, after that 69th week, Messiah shall be cut off. He will be crucified. What does that word cut off mean? To cut off as of a body part, behead, to cut down, to hew, to cut or make a covenant. Um, Sorry, I actually mentioned blood with blood. It is in there somewhere if you read through this. But yes, that's when he was killed and cut. Let's go back. So that's when the science is crucified. There are people out there that will teach that Messiah already filled the first half of the last week of years, the first half of the seven years. No, he is crucified at the end of it. What I want you to take from away from here is when is he crucified? After 62 weeks. These are weeks of years. He is crucified in the first year of a week of years. You understand? You follow that? Crucified in the first year of a week of years. Just like weeks of calendar, uh, days on a calendar. You now you have the seven days that go across. That if this week's in here and he's crucified at the end of 62 weeks, he is crucified on the first year of a week of years. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, go back, play it. It's not, it's less complicated than it sounds. He can also be crucified on a year of Jubilee because you have a week of years and then there is a year of Jubilee and then you would have another week of years. I believe he's crucified on a year of Jubilee. We've been talking about that in this. So, and if he's crucified in a year of Jubilee, and there's 50, and Jubilee is a 50 year cycle. 2,000 years from his crucifixion will be a year of Jubilee. And we talked about that in the last video. All right, the other thing to take from here is see that then this last week, he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. And we talked about this recently um, and how that the middle of the week, it doesn't give you a specific number. Hmm, it doesn't give you a specific number. It doesn't have to be exactly in the middle of those three and a half years. Doesn't have to be exactly in the middle of the seven years. 
Um, and actually in Revel Daniel 12, it tells us it's 30 days beforehand, and that gives Israel time to get to Petra. He shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Okay, so what that's telling us is that tribulation is a specific week of years ending with the year of Jubilee. Excuse me, I said that wrong. It's a specific week of years ending with a Sabbath year. It's not just any week. It has to be a week of years on God's calendar. And it started a year of Jubilee, and every year, every year, and I've said this too, well, it didn't happen on Rosh Hashanah. Wait, we got a special. It could be 10 days later on Yom Kippur. Let's wait till then. Problem is, Yom Kippur, if, if it is, the only way that would work is if it's a year of Jubilee. A year of Jubilee is a separate year in a 50-year cycle. It's, if it starts there, then it has to be eight years long because you need a week of years in there. It cannot start at a year of Jubilee. I believe it ends at a year of Jubilee. All right. So these you have to understand. So now, give me a second. And now when I say all this and I talk about this, everybody's going to think, well, tribulation is all about the Jews. Yes and no. See, judgment is meant to bring repentance. God wants everybody to come to him. Jew and Gentile doesn't matter. What matters is, do you belong to the Lord? So real quick to Revelation 3, verse 10. Who is tribulation for? What is its purpose? Right here. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which has come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. What do you mean hour? Think back to Matthew 24. The day is a thousand years. It talks about the day and the hour. The hour is a shorter period of time. It is the seven years of tribulation. All right. So, now I'm just giving you a whole lot of information. What does it mean? What's the purpose? So if, if, Messiah, if we're trying to count 2,000 years from a year when Messiah was crucified, and we understand that he's crucified on Nisan, but the rapture will happen on Yom Kippur, okay? Excuse me, the rapture will happen at Rosh Hashanah. And we know he's crucified either in a year of Jubilee or at the beginning of a week of years, one or the other. I believe it's a year of Jubilee. We also know that tribulation starts at the beginning of a week of years. So that actually means you'd have to go back to, okay, count 2,000 years, but you're going to go to Yon, you're going to have to go to the beginning of the year for the rapture. So it's either 1,999.5 years or 2,000.5. Because Rosh Hashanah and, and Passover are three and a half years apart. Excuse me, they're six months apart. Does that make sense? They're six months apart. So do you go before or after? Is it 1,995, 9.5, or 2,000.5? Well, if he's crucified after a week of years, and tribulation starts at a week of years, therefore it's over at a week of years, you go back to the beginning of that year. Okay, and that's how you count. Because if Messiah is crucified, if we just do the math this way, and we're using 32 AD, and that's the year I believe. Next next video, I'm going to talk about why I'm saying 32 AD. But if we're saying 32 AD, and you add 2,000 years to it, and then you subtract 7, the math is simple, 2025. But you're going to be wrong. You're going to be wrong because you have to count on a Jewish calendar. Okay. Um, let me do something real quick. You have to count on a Jewish calendar. And when you count on a Jewish calendar, he's crucified. 32 AD is 3792. 
crucified on Nisan, but you go back to the beginning of the year to get to Rosh Hashanah. You count that 2,000 years into the future. And you come up with the Jewish year, 97, or excuse me, 5795. Well, that year, starting on Rosh Hashanah, ending or going into Nisan, is two years on our calendar. It's 2031 and 2032. And we're subtracting seven from that. Do we subtract the seven from the 2032? Or do we subtract it from the 2031? We subtract it from the 2031 because that's when that year started. So 2031 minus seven is 2024. That's why I'm looking at 2024 as being the year for the rapture. But the, the question is, and there's two questions. One. One question is, why am I saying 32 AD? That's the next video. The second question, I'll address in the next video. There's one little thing that could just put a monkey wrench in everything and nobody would be able to count anything. And we'll talk about that in the next video too. Thank you for watching. Bless you. Have a great day.